Welcome everyone to another episode of Let's Talk Real Estate. I'm joined today by Larry Green of ServPro Burlington Woburn. Larry, mm -hmm. welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure My, to be here. Thank you. My name is Anthony Gilio. I'm a realtor here in Woburn. And I've invited Larry today uh, to talk about a very important topic. Um, but before we get into the topic, I'd like, Larry, if you could just maybe introduce yourself a little more sure. and tell us exactly what you do at ServPro. All right. Um, my name is Larry Green, as you just heard. Um, ServPro is a cleaning and restoration company. We specialize in disaster recovery from floods, fires, and we're also mold remediators, which will lead us into the topic of the day. Um, I'm there as I'm a co-owner, and I... Uh, um, handle the administrative side um, and get involved a little bit in the production end of things uh, but basically that's what ServPro is all about um, emergency response 24 hours 365 days great thank you for that mm -hmm. um, most viewers might recognize Larry as he's been on this show before talking about the very same topic we're going to talk about today um, I've invited him again because we're going to talk about mold, and mold is such a hot topic these days in real estate. Um, the topic of the show is called, is it old or is it mold? Um, and it's so important because so many houses today um, are, are experiencing mold problems. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's uh, being recognized as mold, and it isn't necessarily mold. It might just mm -hmm. be old. So uh, I've invited Larry here because he's the expert. And I want to just have a discussion with him about mold. Sure. Um, Larry, obvious question, what is mold? Uh, very simply put, mold is a fungus, very similar to a mushroom. Um, it's, uh, there's about well over 100,000 spe different species of 100, mold. 100,000? 100,000 different species And of you mold. know them all by name, right? Absolutely. I thought so. They're all Latin names, too. <laughs> okay. right? so, um, but uh, it's... It, it recreates itself through the spreading of spores, um, very similar to if, you, uh, if you're out in a field and there's a dandelion that's gone past its uh, flower stage mm -hmm. and you have all the little tendrils and sure. you know, your little kid goes and kicks it around and they spread through the air. Well, it's the same thing with mold. It's, it grows through spores and it spreads with spores, but they're microscopic so nobody can see them until they colonize someplace. And it requires um, you know, a number of different circumstances, a number of different conditions for it to colonize. One is moisture, another one is a good food source. Um, it needs temperature, mm -hmm. it needs some time to grow, and it needs usually a, a very uh, consistent food source, which could be anything that's a porous material, it includes wood, uh, drywall, uh, sheet rock, um, uh, insulation, many different household items, building materials are... So pretty much mold can grow on just about anything. And it does grow on just about everything. Are there there's, anything that are, is there anything that's mold resistant in a home? There's mold resistance, but there's nothing really that's mold proof. Okay. Um, Non-porous substances are generally mold resistant, things like stainless steel, um, you know, uh, countertops, marble countertops, these are things that are non-porous and mold will, it'll take a lot for mold to grow on them. You'd have to have a really bad colonization sure. problem to have sure. it grow and stay in the stale. So. Now you mentioned all the, that there was hundreds and thousands of types of mold. Mm -hmm. Are there common types of mold found here in Massachusetts that you've seen? Um, probably the most common are aspergillus, um, penicillin, which of course is a very advantageous mold to have. It's mm -hmm. what they create the, um, the medicine, penicillin-based medicine from. Um, actually, blue cheese is a mold. Oh. Uh, so if you have blue cheese dressing and not so to- So people are eating mold just about abs every day. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then there's another which has got the reputation as being the black killer mold and that's stachybotrys. Now, all of them have different characteristics, and they actually all compete with each other for space to colonize. Um, they, and they have different growing periods, like aspergillus and penicillium. After you have the right conditions, if you have a water infiltration in your house or a water loss, um, 
they're going to grow in a couple of days, usually mm -hmm. anywhere from 48 to 72 hours. They're going to, you're going to start seeing mold growing on the wall or on the okay. sheetrock or on the carpet or mm -hmm. whatever the surface is. Uh, Stachybotrys, which is also known as the killer mold, black mold, um, which is, can be quite toxic, mm -hmm. uh, particularly to people who are immune suppressed. Um, that takes more like, oh, probably about two weeks to grow. Now, is that type of mold um, more black in, in color yeah. and found often in, in basements and attics? It's not found real often, um, but that's something that you want to get tested for. Sure. You know, if you see a mold, particularly if you see black mold, mm -hmm. you want to test it to make sure it's not stacky. Of course, and we'll get into the testing aspect mm -hmm. of it, but I, I know you brought some examples of mold with you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably might be helpful to our viewers to kind of see some examples of mold and sure. um, as they, they come up here on the screen, if you wouldn't mind just kind of walking through each one of them sure. and, um, and talking about them. Now these are rather dramatic pictures. They're not sure. very typical. Sure. Um, for instance, we have this one here. Um, obviously there was some moisture problems behind the wall. It could have come from ice dams. It could have come from a pipe break could have just come from poor ventilation in the room, but you can see it's, uh, it's rather dramatic. That whole wall is covered with mold. Um, it's probably not stachybotrys. It's a little bit lighter than what stachybotrys would be, um, but this would require taking out those walls altogether because the, one of the key um, principles of mold remediation is to remove the mold at its source, not right. just to bleach it or to um, or to try to encapsulate it, but to actually remove it from the premises. Okay. Uh, another, <laughs> another example of a rather dramatic uh, mold uh, colonization. This again uh, most likely came from, this is a picture of some uh, mold in a basement. Uh, probably had a water loss, may have been during one of the floods that we've experienced over the last couple of years. Uh, but if the water loss is left unattended un, uh, to, um, you know, as I mentioned, mold will start growing in two to three days. Right. And this is a case, this looks like a case where it's been growing for two to three weeks and sure. not two to three days. So. Sure. And uh, here's uh, mold on the ceiling. Probably comes from um, very likely uh, ice dams. Uh, that may have occurred during the winter when it freezes over and water backs up into the, through the shingles or through the clapboards of a house, uh, starts traveling across the ceilings of the, between floors and um, doesn't become noticeable exactly immediately. Sometimes you see a water stain, but in this case uh, it evidently went un, un, uh, undetected until the mold started to grow and flourish. And mm -hmm. So um, it's not something that you want to look up in your kitchen and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, that's not blue cheese. <laughs> and here's another case where you have mold in the ceiling and because you can see how it's just kind of a directly straight line um, going across the ceiling, probably what happened there is you had uh, maybe a roof leak or a pipe, um, maybe or a pipe break mm -hmm. that, right, that was uh, buried in the ceiling. And so it, uh, you can see that the water traveled directly down a channel in the sailing. And um, that's black mold. And there's some likelihood that that could be stachybotrys and, uh, you know, the killer mold. The killer mold. The killer mold, yes. Is that a mushroom? That's a mushroom. That's, uh, that's kind of the ultimate um, uh, progress of mold. As I mentioned earlier, it is a, uh, it's part of the fungus family as sure. mushrooms are. Absolutely. And this is a case where a water loss, uh, water got into the carpet and probably into the pad underneath the carpet and uh, was not adequately dried out. And over the course of time, this not only started a mold colonization, but uh, started its own little mini mushroom farm. Yeah, that's a good picture to kind of um, illustrate that mold is, is living, you know, it's like yeah. a living organism. Absolutely. And, um, you know, growing mushrooms, that's actually pretty. Yeah, that's, you don't see that that often, but, um, you know, it, it happens and uh, 
this means that there's, it's been growing for quite some time. Sure. Now, these are all, you know, extreme examples of mold. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, obviously when you see pictures like this, you kind of know in your head maybe that it's mold, even without getting tested. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of circumstances where it just might look old or it might look dirty, but yeah. um, it could be mold. Um, and we're going to talk about, you know, the testing and, and the right sure. way to test mold, but what are some of the health effects of being exposed to mold? Okay, um, the health effects are mostly felt um, by people who are either, you know, young children or infants and elderly people who have some immune suppression um, mm -hmm. going on or just people who uh, have conditions that are, uh, you know, attack their immune system. Um, for people who don't have pre-existing conditions uh, but have some allergies, excuse me, allergic uh, reactions to mold. Um, you might find uh, runny nose, coughing, wheezing, rhinitis, sinusitis, uh, conditions like that um, will be elevated and people will start to experience them. For people who've already, who have pre-existing conditions, could cause asthma attacks, mm -hmm. uh, could call, cause upper respiratory infections, upper respiratory um, you know, problems. Um, and the same sort of things that you get for people who, you know. Right. So that, that's... Um, you had mentioned earlier killer mold. Is well, that actually the cause of, of people dying? Or it is has that been, just yes. Stachybotrys, uh, for people who have severe allergic reactions to mm -hmm. mold and who are um, where mold is undetected, where the stachy is unprotected, mm -hmm. undetected, you're going to find that people get sicker and sicker and right. it can lead to an infection, an upper respiratory infection that ultimately can cause, um, it has caused death in the past. Okay. So it's pretty crucial that if there is yeah. mold, it needs to be identified and then obviously treated. Mm -hmm. Now, as a realtor, I see um, mold a lot of times in homes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even without having it tested, you can kind of assume that that mold right. is is present. And when it's um, found in the homes, what's the what's the ramifications for a realtor or, or his clients? Nothing kills a real estate deal faster <laughs> than the word mold. Yeah. Um, mold and termites normally, mm -hmm. um, but mold especially, um, even if it looks like it could be mold, um, a, a prospective buyer is usually running out the door. Um, mm -hmm. And what, what I've seen a lot in real estate is a home inspector will come in mm -hmm. and will inspect the, the premise and will um, imply or even say outright that there's mold present, mm -hmm. uh, which is very frustrating because um, just because it looks like mold doesn't always mean it's mold. Exactly. Um, and I know that you probably have that same frustration because you can't really know for certain if something is mold unless it's properly mm -hmm. tested. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I was hoping maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, um, testing is critical in the whole process because you need to know not only what the levels of the mold are, but you need to know what the species is mm -hmm. um, in order to properly remediate it. Um, there are little Petri dish testing kits that they sell at places like Lowe's, Home Depot, like that, mm -hmm. um, which are really not very effective because mold is everywhere. On this table right now that we're sitting in front of, there's some mold. Uh, mold becomes a problem when its levels become elevated above what's called a normal fungal ecology. Mm -hmm. So that's... You're using big words over here, Larry. <laughs> well, it's not that big. Uh, well, three syllables was the longest. Um, but normal fungal ecology means that it's, it doesn't really have any elevated mold uh, levels, and it's generally not a hazard at that point. Mm -hmm. um, the best way to get it tested is to hire a professional indoor air quality professional. Um, it's not cheap. Um, general testing can run anywhere from about three to four hundred dollars. And to take it one step above that, there are people who are known as industrial hygienists mm -hmm. um, who will come in and do more than just tests for the mold. They will um, also if they find mold present, they will write out a protocol for the remediator to follow as to how to um, contain the mold, how to treat the mold, how to get rid of the mold. So it's, um, they're, they're kind of in, their fees can run anywhere from 600 to to $1,000. Right. It's not a cheap, mm -hmm. um, but the mold um, 
testing kits, the home testing kits, you're going to find mold everywhere. So you get that Petri dish, any Petri, you put it anywhere in your home, you're going to find mold within, you know, within a day or so. Now, is it fair to say that not all mold is, is toxic or, or harmful? Uh, absolutely. Well, because we actually right. talked about blue cheese. So, right. you know, if you drop some blue cheese on your counter accidentally no and you were deal. testing for mold, it, your Petri dish would obviously uh, turn up as a positive mold absolutely. test. Um, absolutely. So it's always important to hire a professional certified it, uh, mold tester. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the home test kits are really a poor substitute. Is a, uh, a home inspector, are they a licensed mold tester? Some are. Okay. Some are. Um, most are not. Mm -hmm. Most of them, if they see something that looks suspicious, they'll call it. If they see a discoloration, say, in the sheathing underneath an attic, mm -hmm. uh, underneath a roof, or if they see something, the discoloration in the basement, they will, you know, they will call it sure. um, without being 100% sure. But they're covering themselves to make sure that they haven't missed anything. Right. Um, we had one instance where a um, home inspector found some mold on a ceiling, uh, told the prospective buyer not to walk but to run away from that property, that it was going to cost $50,000 to get it done. We came in, ran some uh, you know, certified testing. I found that it wasn't mold at all, that some people, it was in a dining room ceiling and people had been lighting candles underneath it and the smoke from the candles had gone up to the up to the ceiling and caused a discoloration. It wasn't mold at all. The woman ended up buying the house and um, she's probably still living there happily ever yeah, after. Yeah, hopefully so. Yeah, hopefully and I think so. that's a frustration with this whole issue of mold is, you know, you do have a home inspector who isn't licensed to to um, uh, to talk about mold or to point mm -hmm. mold out mm -hmm. and they overstep their bounds and scare a prospective buyer yeah. and it, just because it looks like it could be mold or it looks old or it looks uh, right. dirty um, it's just assumed you know I'll just call it mold just um, just to be on the safe side and it really should be done uh, yeah. tested properly by I mean, yeah if, if they if they call something mold it's important to get confirmation sure. of it one way or the other sure. um, they're doing their best but the home inspectors can't be experts in, every, mm -hmm. in everything from, electric, uh, from electricity to mold right. to carpentry. Now, I get asked this question, is there a difference between mold versus mildew? No. No, no. and mold, explain. Mildew is just another term for certain types of molds. Mm -hmm. um, usually, the way it's been used in common usage is um, mildew, people call something mildew when it seems like a minor or small mold infestation, okay. um, but it's really just another form of a mold. So when people say mold, mildew, you know, I have mildew in my shower, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a form of mold. Okay, so yeah. they're pretty much the, the yeah. same thing. Yeah, people think that mildew is okay. harmless. Mm -hmm. It may be, it may not be. Right. Now, once mold has been detected, Mm -hmm. Is there um, a right versus wrong way to remove mold? I know that mm -hmm. you know some sellers when they're when they're trying to to sell their property and mold is found, they think that they can just remove it and put it in a trash bag and throw it out. But I know that's necessarily not the right way mm -hmm. to do it. And I was hoping maybe you could give our audience just a little um, sure. update on the right way to to remove mold. Well, we have a manual of. Uh that gives uh, instructions and um, sets out protocols for mold remediation. It's about this thick. It's like the Webster's okay. Unabridged Dictionary. Oh, sure. Some good uh, reading there. Yeah, it's very the fascinating reading. Um, and the main, there are a number of different uh, principles in mold remediation. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing that, uh, that we pay attention to is the safety of the homeowners the say, or the tenants. Um, and the safety of our workers. Um, one thing that's very important in mold remediation is setting up containment so you don't cross-contaminate other areas. And by doing this, we'll go in and we'll set up uh, plastic sheets around the area that we're working in mm -hmm. so that there's no, so that we don't disturb the mold which shoots spores flying through the air and without the containment would just spread throughout the house. Right. Laying there waiting for some moisture and mm -hmm. some food source to start to colonize. Sure. Um, second thing that we want to do is we want to document what we're doing. We want to make sure that we're 
um, very carefully following it step by step, the principles that we work by, um, that when we um, cut out certain areas that we're documenting, what areas we cut out, why we cut it out, and we want to document. And this protects everybody involved. It helps um, somebody who's trying to sell a house for to um, prove to the buyer that the mold remediation was done professionally, that it followed a very specific protocol, a well-accepted protocol, um, and that it was uh, effective in the right. long run. So documentation is very important. A third thing which I referred to before is containment, containing it at source, um, meaning that you don't want to let any of the spores move out. And we also use equipment uh, called air scrubbers, which mm -hmm. are really high velocity fans that pull particulates out of the air they, with a HEPA filter. So they're taking out somewhere around 99.996% of all the particulates in the air, which includes the microscopic mold spores. So right. we're cleaning the air as we work. It protects the homeowner, protects our workers. Our workers generally uh, will wear protective, um, you know, coverings. They wear coveralls, um, work with respirators, um, gloves. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we, when we work in, a, um, in an attic space, we do what's called dry ice blasting. And basically what that is, it's similar to sandblasting. What you do is you just, um, you have a, um, a spray gun which takes uh, dry ice, uh, aerosols it, and blows it against like as if it's sandpaper almost. Okay. And it takes, because mold sets down roots just like any other mm -hmm. organ, you know, sure. plant type like organism, a, plant. a fungus, exactly. Right. And what it does is it gets down to the roots, takes off the top layer uh, very effectively, and, um, and it avoids the cleanup of something like sandblasting mm -hmm. or sanding because the dry ice just sublimates and evaporates into the air, and all you have to do is vacuum yeah, up. Yeah, I mean, this uh, process, just everything that you've detailed right now is so much more in-depth than, mm -hmm. you know, what most people think uh, mold remediation involves. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people have the misconception that you can get rid of mold with bleach. Um, well, I'm sure you've run into this. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of times uh, folks who haven't been trained in mold remediation, certain sometimes contractors will say, you know, they'll find bleach on a wall. Yeah, just spray some bleach on yeah, it. Yeah, just spray some bleach, right. wipe it off. And actually, bleach will work on, on non-porous substances. If like you find uh, stainless steel stainless and steel, granite. Uh, granite. Um, ceramic tiles. Okay. You can go in like in a bathroom shower or something like sure. that. You can go in because that's mostly non-porous um, substances and you can wipe it off with uh, right. bleach and it'll work well. But on porous substances, the problem with bleach is, is that it's about 98, 99% water. And that's what exactly what mold feeds on is right. water. So what you're doing really is you're wiping down, you're wiping off the surface, but you're feeding the roots so that as soon as the proper temperature, food source, mm -hmm. um, any moisture enters back into the scene, you've got to re, you know, you've got to come back again. Right. So if you, even, if you even went on Clorox's webpage, you'll find a disclaimer that it is not suggested or recommended for mold removal or mold. And how many people actually go on the site and read not it? Not very many. Right, because I think the myth out there is bleach kills mold. Yeah. And it does, but only in, um, you know, cer special circumstances. Right. where it hasn't been able to set down mm -hmm. roots. Now, we've been talking all about mold and remediation mm -hmm. and the process that you detailed. It, it sounds costly. Um, and, and that's the big objection I get when mold is found. And right. not just for the health risk, but the cost of remediating the mold. So, yeah. and when we talked earlier, um, you mentioned that you know, most people don't know that it's sometimes it doesn't cost that much at all to get rid of mold. No, I, I mean, it really depends upon the extent of the mold, how, how widespread it is, um, how many square feet are affected, mm -hmm. uh, how much area has to be contained. So every, every um, episode is, a, you know, is, has, is unique in its right. own way. But as a rule of thumb, if you have less than 10 square feet of mold that you need to have remediated, mm -hmm. um, it's rarely, if ever, over $1,000. Right. Um, you know, contrary to some people, like the person that uh, that house that I was talking about before um, said, this is going to cost you $50,000 to get remediated. It turned out not to be mold at all. Right. But I would, 
you know, when you get over, over 10 square feet um, in less than 30 square feet, it will run maybe somewhere between $1,000, $2,500 mm -hmm. to get it done professionally, properly, including testing, et cetera. Sure. Um, and when you have a, very, a much more widespread contamination, you could be anywhere from 2,500 up, depending upon the extent. Um, but we've, it's rare that we've seen mold remediation projects go over $5,000 and, um, you know, unless you have a whole warehouse or, right. you know, or well, a for the most house. part, it's, it's, you know, a thousand or less for small areas right. of mold. And, and usually if you're buying a home, it's usually passed on to the seller right. to fix that before they transfer ownership. Right. Um, and we try to keep the cost down by, you know, by um, doing whatever we can to um, get to it quickly, mm -hmm. to um, follow the right protocols. Um, we remove, the, another principle of mold remediation is you don't clean it or encapsulate it, but you remove it. Remove if it's on it. sheetrock, mm -hmm. we generally will cut out the sheetrock um, anywhere, usually two feet beyond the visible mold right and that kind of makes sure that there's no residual sure. mold growing right and uh, so there's some cost to rebuild um, mm -hmm. but the remediation itself is um, the quicker you get it done the less you know the less colonization there is because yeah, it's and alive and yeah, it's going to keep it's alive, growing it's just and moving spread. and spreading yeah um, it loves so to procreate procreate huh? yes it loves to procreate <laughs> i didn't know that about mold <laughs> Larry, I, I thank you so much. Wrapping mm -hmm. up, um, you know, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. If you are in this situation where you suspect mold, I think it's very important to have it tested and, and have it tested by a, a professional such as Larry mm -hmm. um, and Serve Pro. They'll, his information will be up on the screen. If you have more questions about the show, feel free to contact him or you can email me at anthonygillio at remax.net. Um, again, thanks so much, Larry, for coming. I appreciate right. it. It's my pleasure. And uh, remember, is it old show. or is it mold? Uh, could be either, but, uh, <laughs> you know, test it to make sure. All right. Thanks, Larry. All right. Thank you.